really do want to get started. And so to begin, I just want to thank the um, Chicago Psychological Psychology School for um, this opportunity to present with you all today. I thank you all for joining this session, and I really hope that something, at least one or two things, come out of this session that will really help you in your practice and your work with uh, Black women. So just a little bit about myself. Um, I am from Minnesota. I live in Minnesota still. Um, I'm a licensed marriage and family counselor um, here in the Twin Cities. Um, the population that I primarily work with are um, African-American women, couples, and families. And then I also do quite a bit of work with children. Um, just a little bit about my background. It is rather diverse. I have a um, bachelor's of science in chemical engineering. Um, and I've worked in the corporate arena as um, an engineer for many years. Um, I got my master's in marriage and family therapy from Capella University, and I'm currently working on my PhD in counselor education and supervision at Capella as well. Um, in my free time, I spend time with my family, who's in that bottom right-hand corner. I am, I've been married for, it'll be 28 years this year. Um, my husband is a uh, non-denominational pastor, so we pastor a church, which we've been doing for, gosh, I think it's upward of 23 years. Um, we have five children, they are all adults, and I have two grandchildren, um, two little girls that will be two years old this year. And so my time is spent either working on my doctoral studies or with family when I have that free time. So let's get into our learning objectives. So today, my objective for this session is to help, help you learn more about um, working with Black women. And I noticed just in our participant list that we have a, a, a very diverse group. And so one of the things I wanna set the stage for is, you know, although the things that we talk about today might be relevant to other women of other ethnicities and races, today we're, our focus is on black women. Also, these things might be appropriate for men and that's okay. The other piece that I wanna share is that if you're already working with black women, by no means at all are these things cut and dry 100%. This is what you need to do when working with Black women. As you'll discover throughout this session today, everyone is an individual. And I wanna make sure I start off with that um, so that we can set the stage for understanding that this is not about stereotyping or putting all Black women in a box at, by no means. So by the end of this session, my hope is that you can identify factors that contribute to mental health issues in Black women that might not have been seen before today. You're gonna to be able to identify personal biases, microaggressions and assumptions about black women that hinder the therapeutic alliance. You'll be able to uh, learn about how person-centered or client-centered models of therapy work really well um, with black women. And you'll learn about how to break down barriers to using spirituality in a clinical setting. And then finally, the fun part of this um, uh, session is that we're gonna get into a couple scenarios where we can apply some of the interventions and strategies that we've talked about. So now I had this integrated and it sounds like our poll is not gonna be something that we're gonna be able to show on screen, not a problem. Why don't we just have you use your chat feature and put in the chat a yes or no response to, have you ever counseled Black or African-American women clients? And I'm hoping, Joshua, you can do a summation for us. Wonderful, this is great. I see all yeses so far. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Couple no's. Okay, good, good. So we have yeses and no's and that's great. And again, today my hope is that as we go through this, you'll be able to learn and discover some things that maybe you didn't know before and you'll be able to share some things when we get into the scenario part, portion that are really helpful for other people to know. So to kick us off, I wanna talk about backgrounds. One of the things in the work that I've done in the past, again, I, I've worked with lots of children and again, because I'm in Minnesota, our population for black therapists and counselors is very small. When I say very small, if we have 3000 marriage and family therapists in the Twin Cities, 
I'm probably one of less than, I'm, oh my gosh, 30. And so because of that, I've just done, you know, a lot of work with kids that have come to me that have been black kids. And from the work that I've gleaned, one of the things is about difficult childhoods. And so literature showed, shows us that childhood for many black kids especially girls, is peppered with traumas. And these traumas come from their parents as well as other caregivers. And these things come in the form of poverty, being from areas where there is lower socioeconomic status. There's all kinds of abuses, including physical, sexual, psychological, and emotional. The other areas that our kids get impacted is within their schools. Many teachers in the schools, and I can say this for sure in the Twin Cities, <clears throat> see a lot of black girls compared to their white student counterparts as hypersexual. Um, they're not as feminine as their white girl counterparts. Um, and there's higher rates of school problems. They're perceived as being problematic. And that means they're gonna get higher levels of suspensions, higher increased levels for referrals, and then ultimately end up possibly in the legal system. One of the other things that we've seen is that teachers silence these students and they don't have a voice to speak for themselves. And so some of the statistics that I found, um, the APA produced some stats in 2020 that said that one in four black girls will be sexually abused before the age of 18. In addition to that statistic, between 40 and 60% of black women report being subjected to some form of sexual abuse before they're even 18. And unfortunately, Black girls compared to white girls under the age of 12 have a higher level of uh, higher experience of rape than any other person of color or girls that are white. So these things coupled with something that we've talked about a lot in our society lately, especially because of the things happening with uh, the murder of George Floyd, which took place last year and that court case is going on now, is a rediscovery because it's not new of institutionalized systemic oppression, discrimination, and societal norms that hold these things in place and promote inequality. And these have become significant stressors for Black women. I think about our life cycle and Black women from, you know, the childhood teen years, which we've talked about, to being, say, young adult women and adult women in the working world. Um, I've also worked in a corporate setting, so I've experienced this firsthand, where you are overlooked for promotion. You are seen as um, you know, meeting a quota because you're female and you're black. You're seen as holding positions because of affirmative action and not because of something of your own skills and capabilities. And so when we think about these things, lots of people like to do the comparison. Well, black women's experiences are just like white women's experiences. Sure, that could be true from a gendered perspective, but the thing that makes us very different is the fact that there's the racial aspect to it. And that racial aspect changes the tides and causes additional stressors. And so as we think about how these stressors now are compounded with what has happened in a, in a woman's childhood and teen years, we move into what we call untreated traumas and untreated things that emerge as mental health issues. So untreated traumas and experience coupled, oh, I see it, we now have polls. Thank you, Joshua. All right, we'll get to those in a second. Um, it's not time for them quite yet, but thank you so much for, for getting that. <clears throat> Excuse me. So untreated trauma um, emerges in adulthood um, as a variety of psychological and emotional problems. And for those of you that have already worked with many black women, I'm sure you can attest to the fact that anxiety, depression, uh, mood disorders, feeling isolated, low self-esteem, and then identity issues really emerge um, for many women. And unlike any other cultural group, navigating mental health is very difficult. And sometimes it's uncomfortable because of what you come up against when you try to navigate it. And that's where we come into play as counselors. You know, the things I've talked about up until this point, we really don't have the capability of controlling but there are things that we do control. And these lead us to the microaggressions, biases, and assumptions that we hold about Black women. Now, unfortunately, as I think about all these things, microaggressions for me are probably the worst. 
Um, I found a few definitions for microaggressions. And when you look in the dictionary, the, the definition that they use is very apologetic. So I decided not to use that one and found something out of the literature. So this definition says that a microaggression is a subtle and everyday slight and insult. It can include insensitive comments based on any array of racial assumptions related to criminality, intelligence, cultural values, citizenship. It also minimizes or denies the racial experience of people of color. So that's a very broad way of looking at microaggressions, but it encompasses so many things. And if you just can imagine for a moment the, the level of um, hurt and the level of confusion that microaggressions may cause for people. I'll give you an example. Um, so as I shared with you in the beginning, I have five kids. And I, when my children were all under 10, you know, it's easier. And I don't know if people have five multiple kids like I did, but it's much easier to take them all to the doctor's office at the same time. See the same doctor, do all this stuff at one visit. It might take you a couple hours, but you knock it all at one, out at one time. So on this particular day, I took all of my kids. And again, I had at the time only five of them with, went with me. My older daughter was not there. And, you know, we go into the doctor's office and we are sitting down. The nurse greets us and she's like, wow, are these all of your kids? And I said, absolutely, they are all mine. And then she says, well, do they all have the same father? And I'm stunned. I'm, I, my mouth probably is wide open and I am shocked beyond measure that a person could ask such a question. And here, the microaggression is that as a black woman with multiple children, how is it even possible that they can have the same father? How insulting, how demeaning. And it, it was just completely irrational to me. I think about those types of experiences that black women have in the workplace. I don't know how many people have talked to friends or have experienced uh, being in a workplace and many black women wear their hair many different ways. For myself, I might have braids, I might wear my hair curly, I might wear my hair straight. I do all kinds of things all the time and it never looks the same. I had a woman come to me one time and ask, wow, are those extensions when I had my braids in? Now I haven't heard the term extensions since like the eighties. And so different things like that are just so subtle, but they're insulting. And they call the question who you are as a person, causing you to think about who you are from an identity perspective. Being in grocery stores, I can recall going to grocery stores and having glances at me, having all of my kids with me, probably thinking the same thing that the woman thought in the doctor's office. So again, these are the things that as counselors, if we don't address personally, we bring into the counseling room with us the thoughts and the ideologies and the beliefs that we carry about the person sitting in front of us. Let's move over toward uh, biases. And I'm sorry, my screen wasn't changing for you guys. I apologize. Uh, I'm, I'm on track now. All right, biases. These are a tendency or an inclination or prejudice toward or against something or someone. Now, when I think about a bias, bias can be in a positive way or a negative way. The most easy way to explain for me bias in a positive light is my desire and love for chocolate ice cream over any other flavor. In my mind, since I was a little kid, it's always been the best flavor. It doesn't matter what anyone else says. It doesn't matter how high quality the ingredients are. Chocolate is chocolate is chocolate, and that's my favorite. So I have a bias towards chocolate. If we apply that same kind of thinking to negative attitudes, feelings, or beliefs about people of certain uh, ethnic or racial groups, it becomes a negative. And so we find this a lot of times in our desire to pick friends. Oh, I choose to pick friends that look like me, or I choose to pick friends that like the same things I like. You know, again, there are negative and positive ways to have bias. The key behind it, though, is being aware of those biases and not allowing them to come into play and cause harm to a client we could be working with. All right. Next topic is assumptions. Again, 
This is something that is accepted as true or is certain to happen without proof. Now, the easiest way that I find talking about assumptions is when we have so many, many stereotypes about Black women. They're loud. Many of them are so angry. They're domineering. If we're talking about poverty and socioeconomic status, many times people call so many Black women poor and on welfare. They're combative, aggressive. All these negative connotations are assumptions about people that we really don't know anything about. If I look at my client caseload that I have right now, I say that I have about, I don't know, 15 to 20 individual Black women that I see on a you know, monthly basis. And of these 15 to 20 women, I can say without a shadow of a doubt that they have a variety and an array of personalities, a variety and array of, uh, on the scale of introversion to extroversion, no one's ex an extreme, it's, it's, a, it's a continuum. And so as I think about how I present myself in session, when I get a new client that comes that's, that's a Black woman, I have to make sure that I don't put into play any of my own personal assumptions, biases, and, and beliefs about Black women because I work with them. So although this is something that's really critical to our, our non-Black uh, counselors and therapists, it's also important for us that work that are, are holding the same, um, the same ethnicity or racial uh, factor as our clients because we can also make assumptions and have biases toward them. So the next thing I wanna talk about is why black women avoid counseling. So, you know, there's lots of literature about this, probably not enough, as well as things that we've gleaned from our own clients and people that we've worked with. But black women avoid counseling primarily, primarily due to a lack of trust. There's not a whole lot of trust in our behavioral health system. And this is due to histories of uh, lacking of quality health care, histories of not enough clinicians that understand the demographic of African-American people as a whole, too many experiences of being treated as guinea pigs and test dummies for a variety of medical procedures. And at the end of the day, the lack of training and skills, lack of competence, lack of empathy, the downplaying and minimization of uh, an experience of a black woman just causes people to lose all trust and confidence in the process and the system. And then at the end, many times, and I know this specifically for my area, is that clients are looking for people that look like themselves. They wanna see a black clinician. And in my city, there's just not enough. And so what's important is making sure that regardless of what your, your ethnic or racial background is, developing the skills and competence to be able to meet the unique and individual needs of black women. So let's turn our attention now to one more poll. And it looks like folks are already responding. Maybe you guys can see all the questions and that's okay. Um, let's see. So based on what we've discussed using one word or short phrase, share microaggressions, assumptions, and biases that you have had toward Black women. So this here would be something where in your chat box, if you could maybe put some of these things that you have maybe held um, from a per, uh, perspective of a bias, a microaggression, or an assumption. And I'll give a little bit of time. That's a good one, you people. Mm-hmm. Other thoughts? Uneducated. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, my favorite. I have a Black friend. That's your qualifier to make it all be okay. Mm -hmm. Mm, I don't teach like other professors. All lives matter, yes. Totally dismissing the fact that we're talking about Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. 
They're all having sex. Yes. Mm -hmm. Good. So clearly, oh, best friend growing up was black, but I was raised in time of melting pot mentality. So not aware of different experiences. Okay. Yes. The apology, but I'm not sorry. Yeah. These are really good. And again, these are the things that disqualify us from being able to be effective with our clients. So one of the things that I found that's worked really well um, with, with clients that I see is, because, and maybe I'll give a little bit of background. So coming out of um, my master's program and going into my pre, pre-licensure period, I was sold out on uh, family systems therapy. I was a Boenian therapist all day long because I love genograms, which I still do. Um, but I really was um, focused on using intergenerational aspects of therapy and understanding the history and looking at all the generations and all these different things. And it works. But what I found that was much more compelling and, and aspects that were, much, uh, that were much needed in my work with my clients, especially my Black women clients, is the person-centered um, opportunities that are available. And then so many of them, if I were to say a percentage, I would say at least 95% of my clients come to me and say, you know what, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, or I have spiritual um, beliefs that I want to make sure are incorporated into this therapeutic process. Can you help me do that? And so for me, I've been consistently working from a person-centered spiritual approach with all of my clients. So what does that mean? So Person-centered counseling was developed by Carl Rogers in the 1940s. And so it seems a little counterintuitive to say, wow, so we're going to use a theory developed by a white man that's really effective to use with Black women. And one of the things in my research that I found is that although this was developed using the dominant group of, of white people, Rogers' work also took a turn in the 70s and 80s where they explored this approach across all cultural backgrounds. And it was found to be very effective. Carl Rogers believed that people have the ability and capacity to grow and change by becoming what what he termed self-actualized. Now this approach, which makes it very good to use with our black women clients, it's non-directive, meaning I as a therapist, am not telling you what to do. You have full autonomy, you have decision-making power. This this process and this experience, you're guiding it and you're leading it. My work is to be an advisor, so to speak. It is very uh, empathetic, meaning that I am going to do my best from the beginning of our relationship to step into your shoes, to see things through your vantage point. And I'm gonna put aside how I think it should be, what I think about your situation, and I'm gonna see things through your lens. I'm gonna help empower you. I'm gonna give you tools. I'm gonna provide uh, recommendations and suggestions for things that I think would help you to reach that level of growth and change that you're looking for. And I'm gonna help motivate you. And I'm gonna do that by being present. I'm gonna do that by extending to you all the positive things that you need in order to make growth and change happen. Excuse me. And so as we think about that, A lot of the things that I talked about are related to you as the counselor. Literature also shows us that most positive outcomes and most negative outcomes are due to the counseling relationship. So did you develop a high quality therapeutic bond or an alliance with your client before trying to dive in and help them work on their goals? That means that as counselors, we need to do a really good job of understanding who we are. Before we can step into a room to work with a client, if we're not aware of, you know, what are our biases? What are our assumptions? Um, What lens do we see the world? What lens do we see this particular client? If we're not genuine with ourselves, we can't be genuine with our clients. Meaning, 
you know, are we really honest with ourselves about our likes and dislikes and those hidden things that we don't like to share with other people because they're embarrassing? We should at, at the least be honest with ourselves so that as we come into the counseling room, the therapy room, we're able to be honest and open and genuine with our clients. This sets the stage then for us to be congruent with our clients to be able to help them meet their needs. The other thing that I think about is, which I mentioned a little bit earlier, is because I work with so many black women, one of the things that I always have to check is what past experiences have I had with my black women clients that set the stage for my work with this new client. And unfortunately, sometimes I fail. I go into the session and it's like, oh, she's just like, you know, client X, which is so not true and such an unfair thing to do to the clients that we see. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the next step is thinking about how this work works in the session. Carl Rogers talks about unconditional positive regard. This is like the most paramount part of the uh, client-centered relationship. This is that unconditional acceptance, love, and affection for our client. We see them and their situation unconditionally. We have a warm presence, meaning we don't meet them with that cold-hearted, you know, you did this bad thing or wow, what kind of person are you to do these kinds of things? We don't show up that way. I would hope no one would show up that way, whether they're using person-centered or any other type of approach, but it happens. I was recently uh, looking at something related to um, psychiatry and psychology, and a person was sharing their experience where they had gone into the, the office to meet this person for the first time. It was a psychiatrist. And after 15 minutes, they had diagnosed them, prescribed medications that were for something that they didn't come in there for and felt like, okay, now we're finished and they were leaving. What a cold and unwelcoming situation to have to be in for a person that for the very first time has come to counseling and therapy to get help with some type of problem. And they're told you need medication and I'll see you in, in another week. Unconditional positive regard doesn't do that. It encourages sharing of thoughts, their feelings and actions. And at all costs, there should be no fear of judgment. Now, one of the other things that I do is I am an avid reader and I spend a lot of time listening. Um, I think that goes to a lot of the background that I have from the natural sciences. One of the things that we're taught to do is pay lots of attention to detail. So as I listen to my clients and participate in various groups, I love listening to what people say about their experiences so I can kind of better understand what, what was happening and what's going on. So this slide talks about what black women want you to know. So it's kind of like um, a top 10 list of things that black women have complained about related to seeing non-black counselors. And this could actually be applied to counselors that are black as well. So let's see the first one. Respect Black women for who they are and not who you want them or expect them to be. What's critical here and what I believe is trying to be said is, we are who we are. We're not gonna fit into the shell of somebody else. We're not gonna be like anybody else. Accept us for who, they are, who we are and work with us from that vantage point. Don't try to change us or give us interventions that only make sense if we had the same privilege as our, a white client. And again, this is an easy trap to fall into. If you're working with a client that can't conceptualize something uh, that is due to maybe where they come, what city they come from, or what type of background they come from, or what educational background that they have, trying to apply certain interventions and techniques are completely inappropriate. So if we don't assess those, thing, those things from the start, we put them in a bad position and we do ourselves a disservice with that client. Here's one of my all-time favorites. Don't use black phrases or colloquialisms to join and establish the therapeutic relationship. Just be your authentic self. I recall uh, uh, doing a consultation with the group and one of the um, white therapists that was in the consultation group was asking, so when I, when I try to join with the, this new client that I have, um, she's black, should I say stuff like, girl, um, well, 
what you, how are you doing? And like trying to change your voice and different things like that. And it became just so unauthentic. And so the reality of the matter is you don't have to do special stuff to join. Be who you are. Meet that, meet, meet your client where they are and you come as who you are, but coming as a self-aware person of who you are. Um, sorry about that. My, my timings are off. Listen without judging me as loud and angry. This is so important because that loud and angry uh, stereotype is kind of like an umbrella over black women. I, I have some friends that are in human resources and, and lots of times they say, yeah, that is torn right out of the pages of the black women's human resource manual. They're all loud and angry, which is so not true. We have to be able to listen without judging and recognize that um, every black woman is not loud and every black woman is not angry. That goes with this one. Me being direct is not aggressive. Just recognize that I have passion. And passion and aggression are just not the same thing. I can recall um, working in, in a corporate setting, and this is, uh, oh my gosh, several years, many years ago. And I, my, I worked in a setting where I was the, uh, and again, I'm a chem chemical engineer in the early 2000s in a predominantly white corporation. So there's me, there's one other black woman that's a director. At that time, I was uh, in a lower level. And that's it. I was then given a performance review, and it was not during regular performance review time, but it was at a time where, you know, they just wanted to do like a, what they call a 360 assessment. And I came into my manager's office and some of the feedback was very positive because I, I'm a very collaborative person. I'm very friendly. I get to know people. Again, I'm the only black person working in this all white environment. I don't have a chip on my shoulder. I am making my way through all of the various relationships. Well, then it came to a couple comments at the bottom of the list that said I was combative and I was aggressive. I asked for examples of that and none could be provided. So I say that to say that these types of stereotypes and these types of beliefs are all based on the fact that many times people are not comfortable and don't work with on a regular basis people of different ethnicities and races, which is what my situation was. This next one says, I tell my story with lots of energy and passion. That does not make me animated. One of the things I like to call out about this particular one is that certain words are trigger words and are negative and condescending. The word animated is a very condescending word to a black woman, depending on her background and, and experiences. So recognizing what types of words to use with clients is just as important as how you say what you're saying. Now, this one that's been on screen is one of my favorites as well. We are not a monolith. We've heard that a lot over the past year, especially with all the heightened intensity of um, you know, systemic and racial conversations. People need to learn about Black history, but recognize that Black history is Black history, but we are all still individuals and we're all still different. And we should be treated as such when we come into the therapy room. The next one says that racial trauma is real. Do not minimize it or dismiss it. This is so important. Um, it's very easy to dismiss someone's experience. The best way I can think about this is um, when Video, you know, the cell phone has been a very powerful thing because it comes with camera and video capabilities. And lots of times when a video is created and shared, people say, well, what happened before that? As if what you're seeing on screen and what the video is showing is not really what happened. If I'm watching it from beginning to end, saying, well, what happened before that to try to dismiss or minimize what I'm telling you, that again is condescending dismissive and not uh, acknowledging my real experience. Stop playing devil's advocate when it comes to my experiences, telling me things were not that bad. This is a really unfortunate thing that happens in a counseling relationship. When your counselor tells you, you know, suck it up, it wasn't that bad, you can get through this. Those are not empowering statements. Again, those are minimizing and dismissing the real experience of what happened. So what's the answer? 
be quiet and listen, create a holding space for black women's experiences, even if you disagree. And I took it off this list, but it says, and you know, if you really feel compelled to have to say something, bite your tongue, grin and bear it, and recognize that this experience that this client is sharing with you is very real to her. And your part in empathizing is learning how to make it be real to you as well. So one of the things that happens with um, client-centered therapy is helping your client um, get to the point where their experience on the inside, so their internal things that are happening, you know, we talked about some of the anxiety, some of the uh, depressive symptoms that happen, um, feelings of identity things that are, are happening, you know, questioning who you are. Those things are happening and those are real for the person. And so there's a discrepancy between who they are, their view of themselves, and their actual experience. It's our job as counselors to reverse that incongruence and help clients recognize themselves and their experiences and make them be aligned. So this means that clients become vulnerable. They're susceptible to anxieties and fears. It's our job to help reduce those fears and anxiety and help them work through these things that are happening in their lives to bring some type of um, resolution to them. And for me, that's where a lot of the work that I do with my clients is about integrating spirituality. So as I mentioned, you know, most of the clients that come to see me, they are spiritual people. That means that they might be a part of a particular religion, whether that be Christianity, Islam, um, whether they be spiritual, meaning that they believe in, and here's my definition, my slides aren't going as fast as I am. They may be spiritual, meaning they have a belief in a higher power and a connection to someone greater than themselves that guides and leads their decision-making, their beliefs, and their values. And through my work with, with clients and trying to get some type of alignment between their inner self and their external expression, spirituality has become such a great healing source. So just a little bit of background and statistics, uh, not statistics, but uh, literature here. Um, our, uh, the research literature shows that spiritual well-being is a culturally relevant interpersonal protective factor, meaning spirituality for many people helps them to be better at, in terms of who they are internally. In addition, I found literature dating all the way back, and I'm sure before this, to 1979, that discusses the benefits and significance specifically for Black women in incorporating spirituality into counseling to help them heal. Unfortunately, many times counselors are uncomfortable and unprepared to address spirituality. Now, in, in my doctoral work, my, my research study is focused on the experiences of counselor educators teaching students to integrate faith and spirituality into clinical work. And what I found is that this discomfort and unpreparedness is due to the unwillingness to engage in the topic for many fears. For example, I don't wanna offend someone. I don't want to talk about something that could, you know, potentially harm our therapeutic relationship. Uh, many people often say that they, they don't know how to approach the topic and that trying to engage clients in this spirituality, faith, religious thing is, is you know, it's kind of hard because I don't know a whole lot about faith and spirituality and religion. But what's true is that it's very common for people to request that their faith and spiritual beliefs be included in counseling sessions because it's a cultural identifier for them. In a recent study of 160 Black women from the University of Illinois, 79% of participants reported that they were spiritual. This leads us to believe that somewhere down the line, we have to deal with this topic of spirituality and deal with it from a perspective of being in counseling. So on my next poll, um, hopefully you guys can see it. On a scale of one to five, with five being most comfortable, how comfortable are you integrating a client's faith and spirituality in counseling? We'll give it a minute. I think we have like about 24 people. So I'll give you guys a little bit to put your responses. Oh, we got people going in chat. Perfect. That works too. Awesome. 
good. So on the higher end, this is really great. I'm so glad. This gives me confidence that, you know, it's happening and people are, are doing things that are important for their clients. So as I think about the how to, because this is the big piece that lots of um, counselors uh, struggle with is, you know, how do I do this effectively? Um, the first thing I, I think about is developing the solid therapeutic alliance, which, we, which we've talked about. Before anything else can happen, if we don't have a good relationship, it's going to be really hard for me to ask you certain things about stuff that's really important for our counseling relationship. It's going to be really difficult for me to engage you in a conversation about your faith and spirituality if we haven't developed a solid bond. The next piece after developing that bond is conceptualizing faith and spirituality across all counseling activities. So what I mean by that is, you know, at intake, the very first session, asking the simple question, so can you talk to me a little bit about any faith, spiritual, or religious beliefs or values that you hold? That's not offensive. If they have none, then they'll say, I don't have any. If they have them, they're more apt to now be comfortable and open sharing those with you because you've opened the door. Many times clients as well as the counselor are uncomfortable with this topic because they don't know whether or not it's okay to talk about it in this setting. But this is where the active listening comes into play. As they talk about these things related to their faith and spirituality, listening to what they're saying, understanding, if you don't understand, asking those clarifying questions. This is where those clinical micro skills that we learned in our uh, initial courses in uh, counseling come into play. You know, are you echoing the client language? You know, repeating back to them what they've said. Are you validating? Are you doing clarification? Are you empathizing with accuracy? And are you tracking the relevant pieces of what they're saying? So again, being empathetic, viewing the client with their lens, not our own. And then a big one, which I've highlighted here is managing counter-transference. You know, people come to, come to session with me and I can recall a woman coming in and I, I come from a non-denominational um, church. That's the church my husband and I pastor and we, we pray in tongues. That's a, that's a normal, natural part of what we do in our ministry. And a client came in and talked about how you know, praying in tongues was like a part of a demonic something or other. I mean, she had this whole elaborate thing about it. And being able to manage through that conversation to not be offended one, and then to not feel like I need to now proselytize, become something else. We really have to learn the skill of bracketing. And that's a part of the managing of counter-transference. We have to also throw away our preconceived notions about the problem. So when a client presents themselves to us, you know, this is the problem. We got to make sure that we allow the process to take its natural progression to make sure that we work through what the client wants to work through. We have to allow them to be the guide and the expert. And here's my comment. And if you disagree, bite your tongue and continue to listen to learn. Going a little fast. All right. So this is my next one. Um, faith and spirituality interventions. And again, I'm just providing a few highlights to things that I know work really well and that literature talks about in terms of working with clients to integrate faith and spirituality into, into clinical sessions. One of those is art. I use lots of art. Now, I'm not art therapy trained, so I don't proclaim that, but I use art, drawings, artistic depictions. I have a whiteboard in everything that I do. If I'm doing online sessions, I activate whiteboard. I um, allow, I want clients to be able to see themselves through the lens of their own spiritual beliefs. And that often is empowering and motivating for them to be able to reach their goals. Another thing that I love using is music. Who doesn't love music of some sort? Um, in my background, I have a classical background. I, I, I studied uh, classical flute for, oh my gosh, 16 years and have a love for music. So I use all different types of music with clients, whether it be um, classical, whether it be rap music, R&B, Christian music, sacred or secular, doesn't matter. But what happens is allowing clients to select music that resonates with them, they can even write their own lyrics and, and write their own music. But these kinds of activities help them think about things 
related to their situations and experiences and their opportunities for growth and their goals in a whole different way. I also use faith affirmations and scriptural confessions. So one of the things I found that works really well, and, and I, again, this is not novel and, and I shamelessly stole it. I don't know, many of you might've watched Being Mary Jane back in the day when it was on TV, but she used those post-it notes that she stuck up all over the place. Well, I started implementing that with my clients. I have them write scriptures or positive affirmations on them. And I have them put them up all over their house or their homes or apartments, in their cars, at work, on mirrors, as reminders to them to say these things daily about yourself. Start changing the way you see yourself according to your faith and your beliefs. And people's mindset starts changing. To get something new out of something, you have to put new information in. And so that's what they're doing when they, they're doing these affirmations and scriptural confessions. Finally, bibliotherapy. Um, again, leveraging the Bible, sacred texts, and other things of that nature to help people find themselves in the words helps to promote strength, positivity, and community. So I think we only have time for one of my scenarios. Is that right, uh, Joshua? Let's see. So we're, we're going to do this scenario. And this is Nyla. So Nyla is a 35-year-old woman. Oh, what I was asking Joshua is, do we only have about three more minutes for our session? I was thinking we only have time for one more, for this one scenario, I have two. So I'll do one scenario and then the follow-up questions. Oh, we have till the hour. Okay, good. So we have time. Thank you so much. All right. So Nyla is a 35-year-old woman who identifies as African-American. She's been married to Mark for seven years. They have two children, a boy age five and a girl age three. Nyla is a successful marketing executive for a large company in an urban metro area. She is active in her non-denominational Christian church and believes strongly that her faith in God has helped her manage through many issues over the past several years, both personally and professionally. She has come to counseling due to significant concerns about excessive anxiety and worry related to racist and discriminatory issues she's experienced from her employer. So my first question to you all is, and you can put them right in the chat. You can put them in the poll because I know, well, I guess not in the poll. You can put them in the chat is what cultural identifiers are important to address with Nyla in your first and second sessions? not seeing anything in the chat. Oh, here we go. They're coming through now. Yes, African-American, Christian, professional working mother. Absolutely. Others? I kind of threw in a trick question, a trick in this, not so much a trick, but a, a kind of like a hidden thing. Did anybody think about um, marital status? Good. And you know, this is a time, I think what we had talked about, um, I had talked about with the host for this show, for this session, is that you can come off mute and, and, and make this more conversational if you like. Um, if people wanted to comment without having to put in something in the chat. One of the things that I put in this scenario that, um, yes, female leader, is what is Mark's ethnicity or race? <sighs> Someone commenting? I was, <laughs> actually, I was just about to um, bring that up that it seemed like you were intentional and in not mentioning what his ethnic background was. Yes, I did that on purpose just to see if anybody was gonna say anything about that. Um, because what I wanna know now, so Mark is white. Okay. What, is that, what does that make you all think about? 
in terms of this scenario and how would you, you know, approach this, ses this session with Nyla? Hmm. I think my first thought is that this is an, a new experience for her. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, the discriminatory issues um, and that she's probably had pretty positive experiences or relations with um, um, different people groups. So um, that's, that's why she's a little um, unsure right now how to handle it and how to use her faith as far as how to be able to, to, to navigate through this issue as well. Mm -hmm. That's really good. Um, it looks like Jackie posted in here, if her husband validates her experience at work and tries to understand. Maybe talk about that a little bit more, Jackie, if you don't mind. Yeah, I guess just thinking about if it's something that she feels comfortable sharing with her husband and wondering if, um, you know, something he probably can't relate to. So wondering what that conversation looks like at home. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's really good. I know just in my practice, I had a situation very much like this. Um, and the couple really struggled because the husband, he could not identify. He did not validate. And he didn't know how. And, you know, trying to work with them together, it was, it was very difficult. Um, they ended up um, figuring it out at some point, but it was still very difficult. Other thoughts? My, um, the, the one question that I had on here that, you know, I think uh, was touched on a little bit is, how would you integrate spirituality with Nyla? What kind of things would you do? Roles and finances. Mm -hmm. That is another a good cultural identifier to address. Absolutely. Okay. Since we have time, I'm going to move on to the next one. All right, this is Carol. Carol is 48, she's divorced, uh, black woman. Carol was married for 15 years and divorced due to infidelity in the relationship. Carol has one adult son who's married with two children under age eight. She lives alone and sometimes feels bored. She's an executive assistant for a mid-sized publishing company. Carol does not attend church, but consider her, considers herself very spiritual. She's coming to therapy due to feeling depressed. So for Carol, how do you think about her from uh, cultural identifiers and how would you integrate spirituality with her? Anyone? No one. I hear somebody talking. I think I would say, I would want to find out from her how she incorporates, um, is she, I would want to see to what extent does she incorporate her spirituality in her everyday life experience. Mm -hmm. um, just thinking about, you know, and, and see where she is and go from there. Because just because she doesn't attend church doesn't mean that she may not hold some very, uh, val some values that are very um, spiritual for whatever religion that she holds mm -hmm. um, that could really play a part into her decision making. Yes, completely agree. And then someone put in the, in the chat, explore her spirituality, find out if it's earth-based, et cetera. To your point, that, that's really important. And, and, and from my perspective, leveraging that to help her work through some of these um, emotions and feelings of depression. 
anything else you all think is, is important or critical to point out about Carol? Well, I don't know if this would be quote unquote a cultural identifier with her, but um, the infidelity, because I mean, we don't know if the infidelity was on her part or her husband's part. And right. then looking at the fact that she has a adult son who's married. Um, so, you know, she, she probably struggling with some, I'm going to say guilt or shame or both. Um, the fact that her marriage didn't work out and how can she be an example now or, you know, how can she be, you know, um, a positive role for her son, you know, in his marriage. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. those those things kind of stick out to me. Good. That's really good. I had that listed on my uh, sheet, too, as um, listen for people that point out the, well, who had the infidelity, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm glad you brought that up. Someone just posted a question, too. This is a really good question. Are counselors of different non-religion spirituality than the client less competent to integrate spirituality into therapy? And my answer to that would be no, unless you're not aware of how to bring that client's, you know, faith, religion, or spirituality into the session. So, again, you don't have to know all the ins and outs of a person's belief system in order to use it from a therapeutic perspective. They know about it. They know the strengths of it. They know the weaknesses of it. The questions that you're gonna ask them, the questions that you're gonna pose are irrelevant of the um, type of belief system that they have. You're gonna pose questions to help them think about how their faith, how their beliefs can help them overcome the issues that they're facing. So you don't have to be the expert of, of every religion and faith belief to be able to be competent. All right, it's looking like we're coming up to the end of time, so I better wrap up. So in summary, we've talked about and we've learned about factors that contribute to mental health issues in Black women. We've identified personal biases, microaggressions, and assumptions that hold and hinder the therapeutic alliance. We've talked about person-centered approaches to therapy. We've learned to ethically include client spirituality and counseling. And we've talked through some scenarios to apply these interventions and techniques um, in counseling sessions. My hope is that you've learned something that you can apply to your practice. And I'm hoping that you have a good rest of the day. Thank you for attending. Dr. Lewis, is there a way to connect There's with no way to get the certificates at the end. There's no evaluation form. This is the only one training that doesn't have that information at the bottom of the course. Okay, I will talk to the group to find out what they can do for that and make sure that they can send them to you all. Um, somebody's asking, is the presentation available? I can put my email in the chat and you could reach out to me to get a copy. Thank you so much. I appreciate everyone for attending today and I, I really hope you guys have a good rest of the day and we'll work out that uh, certificate for the CEUs.